Hi everyone, David here. Welcome back to the channel. I hope you're all doing well. Um, yeah, it's pretty cold winter over in Osaka. Um, I just got a haircut too, so that's making it very cold around my ears. Um, <laughs> so I hope you're not too cold where you are. Um, today's video, yeah, I thought I would talk about Japanese, uh, which um, I, I'm very reluctant to do any actual Japanese speaking on camera because I'm a bit shy and <laughs> I think I'm going to mess it up. People are going to be reading me in the comments. Um, but I thought I would give a bit of advice to people who are thinking about starting out doing Japanese study and uh, give you a bit of advice, but also I want to explain some of the big differences between English and Japanese uh, that you should get ready for. And I want to kind of give you an idea how difficult is Japanese really. Um, Japanese has got kind of a reputation of being one of the most difficult languages for uh, English speaking people. Um, and that's true. I think learning a language is difficult for everybody, whatever the language is. There's always some difference in, uh, of course, in vocabulary, but also how they put sentences together. Um, so I wanted to go over some of the big points that you should uh, keep in mind before you start. And uh, well, if I can do it, then I'm sure you can as well. <laughs> I started um, in, yeah, I think I said about 2008. Uh, I did an evening class. I'm, I'm really lucky. My hometown is not that big, but it does have a kind of decent sized Japanese community because there were a lot of Japanese companies based in my hometown. Um, there still are, as far as I know. And when I was looking through the uh, evening class page in my local newspaper, there were some Japanese classes. So I thought, oh, I'll give it a try. Um, I had graduated from university about three or four years before that. So I was thinking, like, I really wanted to learn something again, <laughs> kind of get that feeling of self-improvement or something like that. Um, and I really enjoyed my class. I made some good friends there that I'm still friends with now. Um, I had a great teacher as well. Uh, so if Kayoko Sensei is watching this video, hi. Uh, thank you for all your support in my early years of learning Japanese. Um, she's a famous writer now, so she does uh, English, English learning phonics books. Uh, I believe so. Yeah, she's a she was a good teacher for me. I was very grateful, and uh, I think without learning Japanese, it would have been difficult for me to make the jump to working here. So um, whether or not you're just learning Japanese to have a hobby, or just or for some reason like you want to work in Japan, um, hopefully this video will be useful. Um, before I start, though, please like and subscribe this uh, to this uh, like this video. Subscribe to the channel if you can. Uh, I would really appreciate that. Um, we're getting to I think, 270 subscribers now. It's creeping up, um, so I'm really hoping it's going to keep going. I want to get to 1,000 this year if I can. That seems like a big hurdle, but uh, please tell your friends. If any of your friends are interested in Japanese too, please send them this video, put it on Facebook. If any of my family and friends are watching, please share, share, share. That's really going to help me, come on. Um, yeah, anyway, so please like, subscribe, make a comment if you can. If you have any questions, please uh, let me know um, about Japanese or anything, any requests for videos, I'm, I'm all ears. Okay, so that's enough talking for me. I'm going to make a kind of PowerPoint presentation style. Uh, so I'm just going to go and set up first. Okay, so see you on the other side. Okay, I think I'm set up now. So I'm going to start my presentation. Um, firstly, one of the biggest differences is the writing, way of writing in uh, Japanese. I think that's the thing people focus on the most. Um, usually they don't use the like Roman alphabet, the ABCs. Uh, so I want to talk about the writing systems they use in Japan. Um, there are three main ones that we use that might sound terrifying, but don't worry. Um, hiragana, katakana and kanji. Um, although that sounds like a, a very complicated system, they do have their kind of different roles in the language. So hiragana is mostly doing the grammar, um, the grammar content of a sentence. Uh, katakana is another way of using hiragana. They're, they're written differently, um, but they mostly are used for um, writing foreign words or scientific words, um, things like that. And it also has a kind of a cool um, sense about it. So if people want to do like a poster that's going to grab the attention of you know, young people, then katakana often gets used. Uh, and then kanji, which is probably the one that you're most associating with Japanese. These are the kind of Chinese characters um, that represent uh, words or ideas. Um, they get used a lot in the kind of nouns mostly and the verbs. Uh, so 
the yeah, vocabulary is mostly with kanji, so please be careful. Um, we do often see uh, like uh, Roman characters as well, ABCs, um, but they often get used for kind of making things look more international, I suppose. Um, so yeah, you see a lot of different types of writing in, in Japanese. Let's take a look at hiragana first. Um, there are 46 um, characters that get used in hiragana. Uh, you can see them on there in blue. Um, each of these represents a particular sound. So this is a phonetic alphabet. Um, so for example, the first one in the top left is a a. Uh, um, the one in the top right, that's a wa. <laughs> um, so they usually follow a pattern of a consonant and a vowel pair together. Uh, there are the five vowels as well, the same as in English, and there's one consonant by itself, which is an n, like an n sound. So each of these characters represents one sound, um, which is a bit different to an alphabet, uh, A, B, C, because you can pronounce those in different ways often. Uh, so that's hiragana. Um, katakana has a matching pair of, uh, of characters as well, so it matches the hiragana. So in the same order, all of these have the same sounds as the hiragana. Um, so it's just kind of like another, I don't want to say font because some of these characters look different, uh, but a lot of them do look very similar. Um, I can't, well, you can see a few examples on there. They, they do look quite similar and they do have the same sounds. That's important. Um, the important thing here also is that pronunciation, if you can read these characters, then you know the pronunciation. Uh, it's automatically fixed. Uh, there aren't any sort of different variations. For example, the at sound is always at. It's not a or you know anything a long at sound. So this is all phonetic. That's a lot easier to read, I think. If you think 92 characters sounds like a lot, um, we put the alphabet here. Of course, 26 letters. Uh, but remember that we do have the upper and lower case, so that doubles the number. Fine. Some of them look the same uh, or very similar. Um, they have the same sounds, but they do get used in different contexts. So that's actually very similar to the difference between hiragana and katakana. So uh, it's not as bad as you think. Okay. Uh, kanji, that's hard though. <laughs> uh, let's take a look at pronunciation since I mentioned it. Um, yeah, like I said, if you can read these characters, then you know how to pronounce it automatically. It's always the same. Uh, that is not true of English. Um, I'll give you an example, famous example. This O-U-G-H uh, pattern that has seven different pronunciations and really you just have to learn it word by word. Um, and of course there are regional variations too. But for example, I, I would say this is though, through, cough, rough, plow, ought and borough. Um, so those are all different pronunciations of the O-U-G-H. So that's really annoying. I don't know why English does that. Uh, English is a kind of a hybrid language. We've got like Old English from like Celtic and Anglo-Saxon uh, language and what else? French is in there, Latin's getting in there too. Um, all kinds of influences from around the world. Um, so that kind of messes up our pronunciation. Uh, also, context could be important too. If you see these two sentences, you might think, oh, well, are they the same or not? But if we have the context of the timing, then that does change the pronunciation. So. I read a book every night, or I read a book last week, so read and read. You wouldn't know that just from the word or the spelling. You have to know, you have to understand a lot more just to work out how to pronounce it. So please be kind to uh, foreign people who are learning English. Uh, pronunciation is a bit of a pain in the bum, um, but that's one of the easier parts for uh, Japanese. But please try to remember the Japanese pronunciation of these characters. Uh, there's no negotiation here. Um, so yeah, I, I know a lot of English people kind of just ad-lib their way through reading Japanese. So please, please be careful. It, once you learn it, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot easier to read. So yeah, get on that first. I think that's my recommendation. Do that first. Um, there are some differences between Japanese and English as well. Um, for example, in English, we have a ra or a la. So using the different muscles in your face um, in Japanese, the, well, the hiragana and katakana characters, they're somewhere in the middle of this pronunciation. That's why it's so famous that we, we think Japanese people can't really handle the R and L sounds um, because their version of it is kind of in the middle. Some people go to the ra sound, some people go to the la sound. Um, so yeah, please be, please be um, kind to people learning English, I'd say. 
um, and try to get used to trying to sound like Japanese pronunciation. Uh, that would help you a lot, I think. Um, I didn't really want to get into the weeds too much about um, the grammar, but we kind of have to talk about it. The word order in English, for example, normally we normally do the um, subject, verb, and object. So, like we see here, like Ethel bought a bicycle. In Japanese, it's slightly different. We go subject, object, verb. Um, so, you can see the different parts there. Uh, the bicycle is in the middle of that sentence. And also, you can see the different writing styles as well. Um, so, the name Ethel, that's a foreign name. So, that's spelled in katakana. Uh, that's the green part there. Um, nouns are often used in, well, they can be anything really, but um, in this case, we've used kanji to talk about a bicycle. Uh, that's the middle, the middle red block. Um, some nouns are done in hiragana if the kanji is difficult. Um, if it's a foreign word, that that will be in katakana too. Like um, air conditioner would be in in katakana because that's kind of English word. Um, and the verb, the stem of the verb, um, like to buy, that will be in uh, kanji usually. Again, if it, if the kanji is difficult, they might change it to. Um, hiragana, uh, or it could even be like a English type verb, <laughs> so that'll be in katakana too. But the grammar part of that will be in hiragana, and that's where we find all our um, grammar conjugations if we're changing the tenses. Uh, let me show you what I mean. So in English, um, we have a bit of a combination like I buy a bicycle, that's your standard form. I bought a bicycle, we've changed the verb in that case, we've conjugated that verb. Uh, but for the other cases, I will buy, I can buy, I want to buy, we've added an extra word in there. I think that's called an auxiliary verb. Um, <laughs> I'm an English teacher now, so I should know these things, hopefully. Um, so we add extra words to change that, that meaning. In Japanese, it's not the same exactly. Uh, you can see the blue verb there with the ending. Uh, so kaimas, that means to buy. That's our standard one. Past tense, we do conjugate that verb. Uh, future tense, I mean, there are a few ways to do future tense in Japanese, but generally uh, we would just use the same as the present tense, and we do need a bit of context there. Um, uh, some textbooks will say that there is no future tense in Japanese. I don't think that's strictly true, but um, yeah, not the same as English anyway. Uh, and also things like I can buy, I want to buy, we don't add an extra word, we can change the verb even more. They've got a few more verb forms. So there are a lot more verb forms to learn in Japanese, I think. I don't know how many, I haven't done the numbers, but um, it's a bit more leaning towards conjugation than adding auxiliary, auxiliary verbs. Okay, <laughs> I've lost you yet, it's too much like an English class. Uh, another little thing is about using articles and uh, particles. <laughs> so articles in English, things like a and the, um, you can see the Ethel bought a bicycle. Uh, in Japanese, they don't really use that same th same thing, but we do have what we call particles. Uh, you can see a wa first there. That that's kind of marking where the subject is. So Ethel's the subject, so that gets a wa. Um, there's also a wo there in in the middle. Uh, that's kind of mm, indicating things in a sentence that are happening, like uh, mm, which object is being used. That's similar to English. We have things like in and of and 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 to. Uh, those sort of prepositions and uh, conjunctions. Um, so it, yeah, it's similar. Uh, not the same, but similar. So please keep an open mind when you're learning these. My biggest advice when you're learning Japanese: don't try to literally translate everything in English to Japanese. That's going to make really weird Japanese sentences. So just try to approach it from a Japanese point of view. Um, learn how people normally speak Japanese and then try to mimic that. I think that's my best advice. Easier said than done, of course, but um, yeah, don't worry. <laughs> uh, and counting is different in, Eng in Japanese too. So for example, in English, we say I bought one bicycle, or I bought a bicycle, of course, but uh, in Japanese, we would use a special counter word. Uh, you can see in the purple, that, that means like one, one bicycle or one bicycle type object. Now they have these different counters for different types of objects. Uh, so for example, I bought two bicycles. In English we have a plural form. They don't really have a plural form in, in uh, Japanese. What they would do is take that counter again and just 
it'd be two of those counters. Okay. Uh, it does get complicated though because of the type of items you're counting. Like I bought two dogs. Um, doesn't really have much trouble in English. We can just say two dogs and that's done. Um, we'd use a different counter for animals, for most animals. <laughs> so nihiki would be for two animals, like dogs. There are some weird exceptions. I think rabbits have a different counter and that's the same counter as using as used for birds, I think. So there's, I don't know, historical reasons for that. Um, there's plenty of historical weird things in English too, so don't get too annoyed. Um, bananas too, that goes for the counter of like long thin things or um, big wide flat things I think as well. I, I'm not very good at counters so uh, please don't, don't come for me in the comments. <laughs> uh, so the counters are kind of complicated but then remember in English you have those countable and uncountable words and irregular plurals too like two people, it's not two persons. Um, I can't say one water for example. Uh, mind you, you wouldn't say that in Japanese either, but countables and uncountables are really difficult for uh, non-native speakers too, so please, I, I think just be understanding of everyone. We're all trying to learn something, so yeah, be, be nice to each other. <laughs> okay, um, that was the main thing. I didn't really want to get too into the grammar, but yeah, too late. <laughs> I wanted to talk about some of the other big differences. Um, Japanese is kind of a low context language, which means for example, in English, we don't often drop the subject for a sentence. Normally, we keep the like, uh, you know, I want to da da da. Um, in English, uh, in Japanese, we often drop the subject if that's understood, uh, or if it's kind of obvious from the from who's saying it or what the situation is. Uh, so that could be a bit tricky. I think when you're starting out, don't worry about that. Just learn the full sentence, and then as you get more accustomed to Japanese, you can drop parts of it that you think are obvious. Um, yeah, Pronouns as well, especially personal pronouns. In English, mostly we use I. Uh, <laughs> I think that's usually our main one. Um, in Japanese, there are varieties of you know, I. You might have heard of like Watashi, that's like a standard one for most, most cases. Most, most books will start with that. Um, but there are different ones depending on how formally you're speaking, how old you are, uh, what gender you're, uh, you're, you're representing yourself as. Um, th and these aren't quite as simple as I'm making out as well. There's, there's diff yeah, it's complicated, um, but you don't have to remember that many, actually. Um, just understand the one you should be using. I think that that's what, what you need to prioritize. Um, that also takes me on to polite language uh, or keigo in Japanese. That is a bit of a challenge for me still, um, probably because I've never really had to use it. Um, Japanese has different levels of polite language too. Um, you, you might imagine Japanese is a polite society. Um, the problem with polite language for me is that it often doesn't look very much like the standard Japanese. Uh, the verbs might look totally different. Um, yeah, so that could be difficult if you are a customer, for example, and people are speaking to you in, in polite language. You might <laughs> think, oh, I didn't read this in the textbook. Um, it might be worth learning it and understanding it, even if you don't need to use it. Um, but if you're just learning this for a hobby, then maybe that doesn't matter too much. I've been here a long time and uh, I've never needed to use it, especially not yet anyway. So, um, So those are the big points I wanted to talk about. I hope that was useful. Um, I'm going to go back to me. <laughs> um, I'm going to close all this stuff and uh, finish off this video. Okay, see you soon. Hi everyone, thank you for watching all the way to the end of this video. Um, yeah, I wanted to make that video just for people starting out um, to find out how big of a challenge it's going to be. But if you have any interest in Japanese or you want to move here, then I definitely recommend yeah, just trying it and see what you think. Um, Especially if you're moving here, I really recommend to uh, learn Japanese, at least some Japanese, because uh, otherwise you're going to get stuck in your kind of expat bubble, just speaking to foreigners or forcing Japanese people to speak English, which is kind of, I don't know, I feel like a bit rude if you're <laughs> in their country. Um, so just, yeah, some basic understanding of Japanese will take you a long way, I think. Uh, there are some tests you can take. Uh, they're, the most famous one, I think, is the JLPT which is the Japanese language proficiency test. 
Um, Japanese, it's called the Nihongo Nōryoku Shiken. I can't speak. <laughs> um, there are five levels of that, starting from level N5 to N1. That's the top one. Uh, last year, I passed the N2 after a long uh, journey, so I felt happy to reach my kind of long-term goal. I might take the N1 at some point. I'm not sure, but um, but I start, started studying in England. Uh, in a kind of evening class. Um, it was more of a casual uh, atmosphere and kind of starting the basics. Um, so that was a really nice way to introduce uh, myself to, to Japanese, excuse me. Uh, so thank you again to uh, Kayoko Sensei for helping me all those years. Um, also for pronunciation, um, some kind of AI recording type um, uh, material might be useful, like uh, Rosetta Stone is quite popular. I, I think there's quite a few of them now on the market on smartphones or on computer. Um, so they listen to you, like a, the computer listens to you and it judges for your pronunciation. Rosetta Stone was pretty strict on me and I think that really helped me, uh, especially in the early days. Because um, pronunciation, yeah, you really need to get that down quickly so you can uh, focus on learning all the other stuff. Uh, yeah, I used to mainly study with a textbook, studying grammar by myself when I moved to Japan. Um, so there is the Try series, which I do enjoy. I recommend just taking, taking a look in a bookstore uh, if they have a few different textbooks, um, what kind of fits you. Uh, I mean, some people like, what's it called, Mina no Nihongo. Um, I didn't really get on board with that myself, but that's, that's my, my personal uh, feeling. Just don't take the textbooks as completely um, natural Japanese. They are teaching a certain kind of Japanese, so uh, if you want to speak to people uh, naturally, then I recommend doing some kind of language exchange thing. Uh, there are some free apps, like um, I recommend Tandem. Uh, that's on, on, on your phone. Um, there is a pro subscription, but you don't have to do that. You can just do the um, simple free version and you can match up with people all over the world who are learning your language and you can practice Japanese with them so that's really good I recommend that um, also for t yeah so for textbooks I, I like that try series um, that really helped me for the JLPT uh, vocabulary I uh, vocabulary is re really like a memory game I think uh, there are a lot of kind of memory apps that you can you can practice vocabulary with my biggest re recommendation for English speakers learning Japanese is called sticky study um, it's kind of like a flashcard uh, memory um, activity. So I tried to do like um, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes every day. And you'd be really surprised how often, uh, how much your vocabulary will increase. And that will really help your reading. Um, it really helped me a lot. So I can't recommend that enough. Uh, so yeah, please find something that fits you uh, for studying. Um, listen to me, don't listen to me, whatever, it's fine. <laughs> uh, but I hope this video was useful anyway. And uh, yeah, give it a try. Um, yeah, I think that's all. So please like, subscribe, leave a comment if this was useful. Uh, please don't <laughs> criticize my Japanese too much. Uh, if you have any other suggestions uh, for learning Japanese, then please let me know. Everyone else can see it then, so that would be helpful. Um, great, okay, that's enough for today. Have a nice weekend, uh, have a nice day. Oh, I don't know what day you're watching this, so yeah, take care. <laughs> see you soon. Bye bye.